paying two bucks. And then I'll stop the. Uh... I'll be right back. Sure. Nozomi, have you been involved in a lot of uh, online conferences and? Uh... Oh yeah, yeah. So last uh, last year, I was one of the program chairs for the American Crystallographic Association meeting, and we had a very short amount of time to convert an in-person meeting to an online meeting. That was pretty mm -hmm. intense. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I've um, been doing a lot of event organization. The, actually, the virtual format works well for certain things. I think for educational things. Hi, Susan. Um, Hi, Susan. <laughs> um, you know, for workshops it works pretty well, and definitely mm -hmm. with talks, it's nice to to you know be able to see people in different countries. So. Yeah, it's certainly much better than what we would have had twenty years ago, right? So in that sense, <laughs> we're lucky. <laughs> So do these videos end up on YouTube, it seems? Is it yes, a public yes. link? We are already s streaming it on YouTube right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> How are you, Susan? I'm okay. I'm up early to hear you. How are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> a bit of a being sad up weekend for me as uh, my thesis advisor, Buzz Baldwin, passed away on Saturday. Right. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. How old uh, was he? he? Sorry, he was 93. And really, I feel like this whole seminar series owes him a great debt of gratitude for all he did to set up the problems of protein folding and his gentle, encouraging way he was to everyone he interacted with. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, I just saw that the inventor yeah. of uh, KFC died at the age of 93, so it was not Buzz by any chance. No, I'm pretty sure that he had a lot of accomplishments, but I'm not aware of that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. He was well in the last few years, or he was already sick, or? He was 93. It comes with a lot of. I saw him in a conference a few years ago. I don't yeah, no. How many. Yeah. But he died at home, thankfully, fairly oh, that's peacefully. Good. Yeah. That's sad, though. Hmm. I did. I don't remember Ithaca having such a gorgeous background, Nozomi. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty gorgeous, but the, not that kind of mountains here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got this from Google. Yeah. <laughs> 
I have another one actually. I could switch to that one, um, which is also nice. Uh, All right. <laughs> this is Japan, surprisingly. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so we will we'll wait another few minutes until the, the numbers stabilize before we start. Hi, Peter. Hello. Funny, I see some nice people in the center. list who, who usually don't join us. So it's like uh, Nozomi is attracting a new crowd to the webinar. <laughs> Maybe x ray people. I don't know. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Has everybody been teaching online or? Yeah. <laughs> we get used to it, I guess. Have you gotten used to telling jokes and not getting any response? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always. <laughs> I mean, the students are very good in responding with these emojis and the like if they can. <laughs> in some of the formats, they're not allowed to, I guess. <laughs> oh, it's hard to imagine going back eventually. I don't even know how that would work. <laughs> going back to normal life. I think I could adjust to that relatively quickly, I must say. <laughs> Okay, so I think we can start. And so I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar on protein folding and dynamics. And it's great to see many of you again. And it is our great pleasure today to welcome Nozomi Ando. And she investigates protein dynamics with a, a, an exciting combination of biophysical and biochemical tools. And, she has already made a name for herself for her innovative approaches to use x-ray scattering for probing conformational disorder and dynamics in biomolecules and proteins, things like correlated motions. And so her work is an excellent match for our webinar. And so it's, it's wonderful to have you here today, Nozomi. So a few words about her career. She did her uh, undergraduate work in, at, the, at MIT in, in physics but also in music. Uh, she's an excellent soprano. And if, so if you ever get to meet her at a regular conference, stay close to the piano and you might get a fantastic performance, I can tell you. Uh, then uh, Nozomi moved on to do a PhD uh, in physics uh, with uh, Saul Gruner at Cornell. And she primarily worked in, on high pressure X-ray scattering and that sparked her interest in extremophiles. And then she moved on for a postdoc at MIT with uh, Kathy Drennan, uh, where she got interested in, in metalloenzymes. And then in 2014, she moved to Cornell, uh, to Princeton as an assistant professor. And then in 2018, she moved to Cornell, where she is in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology. She's already received several distinctions, like an NSF Career Award and a Margaret at our early career award of the American Crystallographic Association. And so uh, she's already a distinguished um, member of the, of the scattering of the biophysics community. And so we're very much looking forward to hearing about your work. Before we start, a few technical points I want to mention again. Uh, please, everyone, switch off your microphones to minimize any interruptions. If you have a question, please just say I have a question in the chat or put the, the question in your chat and then we'll call you at the end for our discussion. Um, as usual, we'll lock the meeting after a few minutes to prevent any Zoom bombing. Uh, 
Um, and as you know, the talks are all recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel in case you miss any of the uh, events. Um, you can go and have a look there. And just in case you will not be around uh, at the end of the discussion, our next lecture in two weeks on the 22nd of March will be given by Jörg Enderlein on advanced correlation spectroscopy, how it can be used to study dynamics. And I would also like to remind you of our website. You can see the link here on the cover slide. So please go there if you have any questions. But now, Nozomi, thank you very much for joining us at this rather early hour on the West Coast. And I will give the screen to you. Great, thank you so much. Fortunately, it's 11 a.m. for me, so not too early. <laughs> But oh. thank you for the people who are on the West Coast who are joining at 8 a.m. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for that really, um, really kind introduction and also to all of the organizers for inviting me. Um, I was just chatting with, with the organizers before the meeting about how long this meeting series have been going on, right? And it's, we said May. Um, so the content and the speaker lineup have, have been both really amazing. So I think I... I speak on behalf of everyone here when I say thank you for <laughs> your dedication and uh, making this happen. All right, so I'm gonna get started. The title of my talk today is Thinking Outside the Lattice. Um, and this is actually the title of a, an article that I wrote for the spring issue of ACA Reflections, which is a quarterly magazine for the American Crystallographic Association. And I wanted to mention this because um, this issue came out exactly on March 8th last year um, in celebration of International Women's Day. And it was just by coincidence that I'm giving this talk today. Um, but it's been exactly a year. And um, at this time, um, when I wrote this article, I was asked to write about some research um, for the young scientist. And so I told the story of um, results that we published last year on diffuse scattering, which I'll talk about today. And I told it in the form of a Star Wars trilogy. So this is the outline of my talk. Also, I'll talk about um, the rise of diffuse scattering and why it gave us new hope on um, understanding protein dynamics, all of the technical um, and sort of theoretical complications that came with trying to interpret the diffuse scattering, um, and then ultimately how we had to return back to this question of protein dynamics. Um, and this work is primarily the work of Steve Meisberger, a research associate in my lab, very talented, um, and our collaboration with David Case at Rutgers, um, who did a sabbatical in my lab for a year uh, while we were still at Princeton. So I'll tell the story kind of in this order. Um, and so episode one is the rise of diffuse scattering. Um, and before I go into diffuse scattering, I think it's really useful to talk about um, conventional crystallography so that we're all on the same page. Uh, and so here I have like a very simplified diagram of X-ray crystallography, which is um, still the primary way to get high resolution structural information of molecules. Um, but we have X-rays shining on a crystal and the crystal acts as a diffuse sorry, as a diffraction grating, right? And so we get co uh, constructive interference only in certain directions that uh, sort of concentrates the, the scattered X-rays. And then when we measure uh, the diffraction pattern, we see these characteristic spots um, that we're all familiar with seeing. Um, and it's really, you know, the crystalline order that affords this atomic detail. And this is what we've come to expect from crystallography just as an example of the sort of detail that we've uh, become used to seeing, uh, here's an electron density map of a heme cofactor from one of our structures. Um, so that's crystallography. And I want to do it like a deeper dive into what is a structure in the first place. And this is something I teach my students um, in my structural methods class. Uh, but we have to remember that a structure is a model. And so here I'm showing one of my favorite crystal structures uh, which is the coronoid iron sulfur protein methyltransferase complex. Um, it's an enzyme that's involved in microbial carbon fixation. Um, and you can download this structure. This was solved by Yan Kung when he was a graduate student in Kathy Drennan's lab. Um, you can download this PDB file from the, the protein data bank. And what you'll notice at the bottom of any PDB file is there's a huge table 
um, with information about every atom that was built in this in this that model. And so I'm showing just one line of that giant table. Uh, this is atom 12,872, which is one of the nitrogen atoms in lysine 23 and chain F of this model. And you'll notice that there are a bunch of numbers after that. Um, and the first three numbers are the atomic coordinates, X, Y, Z. And this is really, you know, the, the ultimate goal of structural biology and structure determination in, in general is to get the coordinates of every atom. Um, and, and we have this impression that crystallography is giving us a static structure, a high resolution, but a st static structure. Um, but it's already clear just from um, just looking at a PDB file that molecules inside of a crystal are still moving just like they do in solution. And so this actually represents the average um, coordinate. And there are two other numbers that describe the probability that the atom is actually there. Um, and so, the first number is occupancy, which we often set to one if that atom is part of a molecule. And the second number is the so-called B factor or the temperature factor. And this is a measure of atomic motion. It's um, describing the fact that, you know, even within a crystal, which is very ordered, uh, the atoms, the identical atoms in different you know, cells and different copies of the protein are not exactly in the same place, right? So, even though a crystal structure appears static, there is um, atomic motion still happening in the crystal, which we expect of any real crystal. Um, and here, um, I've colored the structure in terms of the B factor. And the B factor is related to the mean square displacement. So U is the displacement from the center. So if you imagine these blue numbers that represents the sort of ideal position of the atom, but it's not always there, it's fluctuating about that point. Uh, with displacement u, and that's what the B factor is telling us here. Um, and in this particular structure, the B factors were kind of informative because you could see that there are parts that really pop out, they're red. Um, and it was meaningful for this particular structure because that those two domains made no lattice contacts. And they also are responsible for holding uh, the cofactors, which is a vitamin B12 derivative, it's cobalamin. And for this enzyme to do its reaction, which is a methyl tra transfer reaction, this cofactor has to swing quite a bit. And what we were seeing is that because these domains were making no lattice contacts, they were free to move, they have high B factors. And in fact, if we add in substrate, um, we could see turnover inside the crystal. So, which was very cool. Um, but this is all to say that, you know, molecules are always moving and even inside of a crystal, they're moving. Um, and also, I want to reiterate that the structure is still a model, and so we, we're trying to get um, we're trying to get a model of every all of the coordinates of every atom, uh, and sort of a model for its motion that is consistent with the data. So the data for crystallography is um, Bragg diffraction, and so here I'm showing a very nice diffraction image. Uh, we all recognize it to be diffraction because it has these nice spots, which we call bag reflections or peaks. Um, and in crystallography, conventional crystallography, the measurement of these intensities, we call them Bragg intensities, um, many measurements of those, and so we need to have many observations, is what allows us to uh, refine a structural model that has many parameters like the one we, I just showed you. Um, Okay, so this is nice and all, but there's actually more to um, diffraction than that. Um, and to illustrate that, uh, it's informative to think about what we learn about crystallography uh, in textbooks. So um, the important thing is that scattering uh, from a crystal is can be described by as the Fourier transform of the electron density. So this is called the structure factor. All you have to remember is that you know every electron, you know in the case of X-rays that are scattering, every electron is scattering um, because of the, the incoming X-rays, and the ultimate sort of diffraction pattern or scattering pattern is an interference pattern of 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 those individual scattering events, and that can be described as a Fourier transform of the electron density, and this is like a fundamental um, sort of uh, reason why we can get structural information from um, scattering-based techniques, crystallography, also cryo-EM. Um, 
right? Um, and so we call this, you can think of this as like the scattered wave or the structure factor. Um, and, but what we measure is intensity. So we have to take the square of that, um, which is fine and all. And what we learn is, you know, we have constructive interference in very specific directions from a crystal and that's what we call diffraction. Um, however, I already told you that the, you know, a real crystal is not a perfect crystal. There's always some disorder, which we model even within the crystal structural model, model right, in terms of B factors. So what we're actually measuring is um, the ensemble average or what, what we assume is like the time average. So we put brackets around the structure factor squared. And there's a consequence to that, which is that the total scattering from a crystal actually has two components. Um, there's a Bragg component and the diffuse scattering component. Um, the Bragg component is the sort of lattice term, and this is what we use in crystallography. And the main difference between the total scattering and the Bragg diffraction is where the two is. Is it on the outside or on the inside of the brackets? Um, and in crystallography, you know, what is actually periodic is the average position. So not surprisingly, we take the average of the structure factor before we take the square. That, that's the sort of definition of the Bragg uh, diffraction. Um, and if there's any disorder at all in your lattice, then these two are not the same. And so the difference is actually the diffuse scattering signal. It's a continuous function. And why do we care about diffuse scattering? Um, we, and that has to do with the fact that with crystallography, we get information about the average, right? So the, the average structure factor is a, a function of the average electron density in the unit cell. And we can get information about atomic motions in terms of the displacements, the B factors, but it doesn't tell us whether those displacements are happening um, in a correlated fashion. That information only resides in the diffuse scattering signal. So um, clearly there's some information here that's really useful, but conventional crystallography has been only, only utilizing the, diff the Bragg diffraction so far. Um, and in fact, sort of removal of the diffuse scattering is one of the first steps in data processing. But just to illustrate again, why the diffuse scattering is a useful signal here I'm showing a simple simulation that Steve did of a, a pair of identical helices, alpha helices that are undergoing some kind of displacement. And the displacement is the same amount, except different kinds of motion in each case. So in these three cases, the B factors will be exactly the same. So by Bragg diffraction, we can't distinguish these scenarios. But if we simulate the diffuse scattering, then we actually see different patterns. So the important thing is that, um, again, we've been only using the Bragg diffraction so far, and that can provide us some information about whether things are moving or not. But ultimately, if we're interested in proteins, what we care about is whether something is moving relative to something else. Um, that is the information that we need in order to understand things like protein allosteric. Okay. Um, and this was an idea actually, um, that has been known for uh, many decades, uh, but one of the, the seminal studies that really sort of um, pushed this idea forward was this work by Casper and Clarage um, and what I'm calling the new hope in, in episode one. Uh, so in this case, what they did was they grew a crystal of insulin and they overexposed the X-ray image. So it's a snapshot, but a really long exposure. And when they did that, they started seeing um, different types of signals in the image. So um, for example, you can see this sort of diffuse ring, uh, which we often attribute to solvent. Um, and this would be a good point to remind people that, you know, protein crystal is not, not like a typical solid, it's about half solvent, right? So we have proteins lined up in a three-dimensional array, but there's no dead space, everything is filled in, in water. Uh, so we have a solvent ring here. Um, of course, as expected, they saw bag reflections, uh, but they also saw some sort of sneery, cloudy patterns that didn't seem to be like the isotropic ring that you would expect just from solvent. And it's kind of hard to tell from this inset, but they call this variational scattering. Um, and they 
did some data processing to uh, separate um, this sort of variational scattering that was not neither isotropic like the solvent ring uh, nor sharp like the Bragg peaks to get this image right here, which they uh, termed cloudy diffuse scattering. And to interpret this, they actually um, invoked a model known as a liquid-like model, which is a, a model for the internal dynamics of a protein um, that has like a liquid-like uh, correlations. So it's not a very realistic model. Um, but what they saw was that they could reproduce a sort of, um, sort of, I don't know, fluctuating features that they saw in the cloudy diffuse scattering. And so uh, biological diffuse scattering uh, measurements had been done before, but this was really the paper where um, the authors really made a strong statement that you know, the majority of this sort of cloudy pattern must be due to the internal motions of proteins and that there was this hope that we would be able to get information about protein dynamics from crystallography. So that was very exciting. Of course, it's been quite challenging and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and in terms of sort of like key ideas that have come out in the past few decades, another one has to do with the relationship between the B factor and diffuse scattering. So I'll show you, uh, here are the two schematics. This one I already showed you before, which is if you have a well-ordered crystal, then you only get constructive interference, you get the diffraction spots. Now, if you have any sort of disorder in the crystal, then what happens is that the X-rays don't go where they're supposed to go. Instead, they go in between. And this is what gives rise to the diffuse scattering. And I already told you that the total scattering of a crystal is the sum of these two. So it's not surprising that if we lose any X-rays due to disorder, um, and it, it doesn't go into the diffraction pattern, then it'll go into the diffuse scattering pattern. Um, but there's more than that, which is that, you know, this is, th this whole process has to be related to the B factors as well, because any decay uh, in the, the sort of diffraction pattern that causes the X-rays to go in the diffuse scattering pattern is also modeled by the B factors. So um, just to reiterate what I'm saying here, Disorder in a crystal will lead to decay in the diffraction pattern and usually starting at the highest resolution. So this is why we lose um, the atomic details when we have a disordered crystals. Um, but that X-ray doesn't disappear. It goes into the diffuse scattering pattern. So it's still telling us something. And um, there was a paper that came out in 2009 by Peter Moore that was very um, influential for me when I was thinking about uh, what areas I wanted to work on in my independent career. And this paper called On the Relationship Between Diffraction Patterns and Motions in Macromolecular Crystals uh, really um, inspired me. And it's, it's um, so I'm here, this is actually just an excerpt from the abstract, but essentially what Peter Moore was doing was he was warning the crystallography community that, um, you know, we often assume that groups of atoms in conventional crystallography, um, we assume that groups of atoms move together in order to um, refine a structure. And, and oftentimes we sort of ascribe biochemical meaning to, to those motions. But uh, his point was that, you know, the B factors alone can't tell you if those mo uh, motions are realistic or not, and that they should be validated with diffuse scattering. So, um, you know, I said, you know, that we often make this assumption that atoms move in groups all the time. And, and one of the practical reasons, I mean, there's a good reason for doing that, which is that it's part of a molecule. So, you know, an atom that's part of an amino acid should move with the rest of the amino acid. But the other practical reason is that it can reduce the number of parameters in the refinement. Um, however, the, the key takeaway is that any atomic motions implied by refinement of a structure should agree with the few scattering. And this is something that had not been done. Okay, so um, diffuse scattering has been known for a really long time, for probably since the beginning of crystallography, but it, it's, it's a mature field in the material sciences and not so mature in the biological sciences. Um, here I'm showing, you know, like a lot of the, the sort of studies have been done on the biological side, but it's still very small compared to the material side. Um, there have been a number of challenges, um, including the fact that, you know, unlike in materials, uh, 
science, you know, we're dealing with large macromolecules. Um, we're dealing, they're radiation sensitive and they're just very complicated. Um, if you're interested in, in reading about these, these um, in context, uh, we wrote a, a review article here um, that covers everything up to here, 2017. Um, but I guess both measurement and interpretation have been difficult in this field, which is why it's been such a big challenge. But really like the key thing is that in structural biology, the validity of a model really boils down to just two things. Um, one is the statistics of the data, right? So the data quality. And without that, we really can't move on to the next step, which is how well the model and data agree. But there are two aspects. Um, and this is very well established in conventional crystallography, but it has been very difficult to establish in diffuse scattering. Um, and I would say something that's still developing in the cryo-EM field. Um, in, in any case, going back to diffuse scattering, and neither of these were compelling for the, the reasons that I told you. Um, okay, so to end the first part of my talk, um, X-ray diffraction has been around for a really long time. Um, you know, Bragg diffraction, which was sort of, um, sort of shown to work by this Nobel Prize winning pair, William Bragg and William Bragg. Um, it's been around for a long time and diffuse scattering has been known for a long time. And it was proposed over 30 years ago that it should have the, it has the potential to animate crystal structures, um, but it hadn't been realized. Um, and I, I'll, before I move on to the next part, I should say that one of the reasons is because, you know, in diffraction, we have x-rays concentrated and going in, in, in specific directions, but diffuse scattering, you know, the x-rays are going everywhere. So even though the number of photons going into each signal is about the same, it's spread out in reciprocal space for diffuse scattering and, and that makes it very weak uh, relative to the dry diffraction in any one direction. So that's been like a key bottleneck. Um, so I'm gonna move on to episode two, which is um, the Death Star, the attack of the phonons. And this will become clear uh, what I mean. So in 2012, um, pixel array detectors were becoming common everywhere. And so I'm actually showing you slides from Saul Gruner um, from this meeting, this biodynamics meeting that happened in Buffalo, uh, which was very interesting. He had, this was a talk that he gave right after me. Um, and here he's showing um, a sort of a screenshot from a work by Clara and, and George Phillips saying that, you know, the future is to sort of complete this refinement of, of a crystal structure and the dynamics by utilizing the diffuse scattering. Um, and that there is this hope that this would happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And why is that, right? So his answer was that measurement is really difficult. Um, so just to, you know, uh, go through some of the things he mentioned, right? The, diff the scattering is going to compete with all sorts of other uh, sort of artifacts that will be difficult to um, separate, everything will scatter along with the protein crystal. Um, very little is known about the temperature dependence. Um, and like I said, the diffuse intensities are very weak compared to the Bragg spot because of the way they're spread out in reciprocal space. And so his solution was, you know, pixel array detectors are now available. So the field should revisit um, uh, this problem again. And I think actually a lot of people at that meeting did actually revisit this, this problem, but it was, it was a good time in general to do so. Um, and just to give you context and, you know, in the structural biology field, this was also around the time that direct detection devices were becoming available for cryo EM um, and enable the uh, resolution revolution. So detectors, the measurement is very important. And this is also true for diffuse scattering. So uh, when um, my group started working on this in 2014, it was like a prime time to, to begin because of the availability of these pixel array detectors. Um, here's Steve shown uh, with the Pilatus detector with the cover on so there's no damage done to the detector. Um, and another thing that we brought um, that was probably kind of new and the diffuse scattering field is that uh, my group was the first uh, 
to come from the small angle X-ray scattering side as opposed to the crystallography side. Um, and I think that was actually really important because scattering is a very weak, easily corruptible signal. Um, and so we need to have uh, be very comfortable with uh, setting up beam lines and writing data processing software and be extremely um, nitpicky about data quality. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our first attempts um, because it was really informative. Um, so within you know a year, Steve had some interesting data and uh, he actually grew crystals of that coronary iron sulfur protein methyltransferase complex that I mentioned in the very beginning um, and collected a full diffraction data set. And this was the sort of um, typical image that he would get. You would see a Bragg diffraction, um, just nice, but then there would be some really sneery um, sort of pattern at the high resolution end. And so, you know, a crystallographer who would see this might think this is a really ugly diffraction pattern. Um, so what Steve did was, um, the first thing he did was he figured out a way to map these two dimensional uh, diffraction images back into three dimensional reciprocal space. Um, and he did that and then, so this is a three dimensional map at this resolution right here. And, and if you look at the surface here, you could see there are spots and that's a Bragg diffraction. And so um, telling us, okay, well, there's a, that diffraction signal. If you go out further in resolution, what do you see? And this is what he, he saw out here. Um, and so this was really actually very exciting because up until this point, we weren't totally convinced that the smeary pattern uh, was truly meaningful. But if you map it in 3D, you start seeing that they connect. Um, and in addition, you know, we use no information about the symmetry of the crystal, uh, despite that you start, start seeing symmetry in the diffuse scattering pattern. So this was a good sign that there was something there, some kind of untapped information um, to, that we should look into. Um, and also because of the appearance of, of um, the, these maps, we, we actually called these the dust star. So this is what I mean when I say the death star, you could see that um, because of the, the shadow of the beam stop appearing like the, the laser weapon, I don't know what this is called. Um, we called it the death star and it, it also appeared somewhat mechanical because of these lines in there. Um, so the early attempts you know, told us there's something there. However, it also told us something more important, which is that uh, data processing was going to be really important uh, because you know we should not be seeing shadows of the beam stop or these these sort of lines in our our data. Uh, the signal of interest is extremely weak, and so we spent the next few years actually optimizing uh, experimental and um, computational methods. So this is a lot of work that's summarized in a single slide. Um, but ultimately we, we decided that we needed to um, have certain key elements to get high data quality. One was to do the measurement as if it was a SACS experiment, a small angle X-ray scattering experiment. So we would actually experimentally measure the background. So we would measure the background as well as the crystal diffraction. Um, but we also um, wanted to make use of some of the key features of the newly available pixel array detectors. Um, and that included the fact that um, in addition to having a high dynamic range and a very small point spread function, uh, these detectors have really fast frame rates. And so we can collect finely sampled data. So specifically, I said, um, we collected low dose fine sample data. And what that means is um, unlike the Casper and Clarage image that I showed you before, that was a long exposure, we take short exposures to avoid radiation damage. Um, but we collect a lot of them as we're rotating the crystal and finally sample them. And we can do that with a pixel array detector because of the high dynamic range as well as that uh, fast frame rate. And that allows us to generate a data set that is large and has a lot of data redundancy. And then we can utilize some of the strategies from crystallographic refinement that, that, um, that sort of leverages that redundancy information.
Um, and I'll just mention too that all of our experiments were done at room temperature. So the data I will show you today is a room temperature data set. Um, and Steve also went on to uh, write a software pipeline to process the data um, that sort of utilizes those features of, of that I just showed you um, in the experimental um, setup. And I'm not going to go into details too much, but you know, it, some of the key features include the fact that um, using the pixel array detector, which um, is photon counting, he was able to use Poisson statistics to separate the Bragg signal from the diffuse scattering signal as he's mapping it into 3D. Um, and then using that sort of data redundancy that we see, he was able to sort of uh, account for the experimental artifacts that have nothing to do with the crystal, such as, you know, as we rotate this crystal and it has a certain shape, um, the absorption will change. Um, the amount of material outside the crystal could, could vary as we're rotating, rotating the crystal and so forth. Um, and so this allowed us to really clean up the data. Another really important innovation was to put intensities on, on an absolute scale of intensity of electrons. Sorry, and um, there was a really neat trick that uh, was involved in this, but the reason why this was important was because this allowed two things. One was we were able to subtract the inelastic contribution, which has no structural information. It's only the elastic scattering that tells us about um, how scattering from different atoms will interfere to form the pattern. Um, and the other reason why this was important was because by placing intensities on an absolute scale, that meant any sort of model that we fit to it would also have to explain the intensities. And so it would allow for more rigorous uh, tests of model data agreement. Um, and what resulted from that was a very finely sampled three-dimensional diffuse map, which I'm showing here. This is, you can think of this as the second Death Star. Um, and just zooming in here again, once more, uh, this is um, the diffuse map from triclinic lysozyme. So this is hen lysozyme. And the triclinic crystal form is the lowest symmetry one. Uh, that was useful, the fact that it was low symmetry. Um, and the, the key reason why it was useful is because there's only one protein uh, per unit cell. And that means that uh, we have very uh, small unit cell dimensions in real space, which translates to really large dimensions in reciprocal space. And by separating out the, the Bragg diffraction, uh, we could see a lot of the features in between. So this is just to show um, just how sort of finely sampled the data could be. And the Bragg peaks for this particular crystal form are very sharp. So an angular spread or a mosaicity of only 0.02 degrees. And we could separate it from all of these or nearby uh, scattering features as well. Um, and because of that fine detail, we, we have many, many observations, um, unique observations of 15 million voxels are in this map right here. Um, but you'll notice actually, you, you see this lattice pattern here. And that was one of the first things that popped out when we got a map that was so finely sampled, um, which is there's actually no Bragg diffraction in here. They've already been filtered out in this map and yet you still see remnants of that lattice. And so if we were to take a slice through that Death Star and look at all the different components of the, the signals in there, um, you know, there are some things that are expected. There's an inelastic scattering, which we subtract out, the isotropic solvent ring, which is um, a contribution of both solvent and protein, but centered around three angstroms. And then the diffuse scattering, the variational scattering. Um, and within the, the variational scattering, there are two types of signals. Uh, the, what Casper uh, and Claraj and the rest of the field had long called the cloudy diffuse scattering, as well as these bright spots were becoming really apparent and we called these halos. Um, again, there's no more Bragg diffraction in here and yet we're still seeing things that look like Bragg diffraction. Um, and not only that, but they extend kind of far from where the Bragg diffraction is expected. And this is really a sign of some kind of translational disorder in the crystal. There's long range correlated motions. Um, in other words, this identical atoms in different unicells are correlated. And that was uh, really surprising. Um, so that was the first thing that um, we sort of saw with this finely sampled map. And I'll show you 
um, again, it, it'll become clear as we, we do a slice through of this map. This is a three dimensional map that we're kind of zooming through. And you could see that these um, halos appear to blink at specific values of H, they're, they're in, uh, integer values. So along the lattice planes in reciprocal space, we see the halos appearing because they, they are sort of co-localized with the Bragg diffraction. So that was really um, surprising. And the first thing we had to explain. Um, so what do they mean? Um, well, so here I'm showing a, a zoom in of a region of um, sort of a slice of, of reciprocal space. And if you choose a few very strong, roughly symmetric halos, and look at how the intensities decay away from the Bragg peak positions, which are already filtered, that's why they're white in the middle, then we see actually uh, that there's a characteristic um, exponential decay um, with an exponent of two. And that type of decay is suggestive of um, so-called acoustic phonons or lattice vibrations. And in fact, they kind of there's if you plot the, the intensity, you know, on a semi-log plot, you could see that you know this region is quite linear all the way to very close to the Bragg peaks. And based on the position of these, the lowest um, angle peak is telling us that you know something like uh, 300 angstroms of distance. Um, so atoms are correlated over that sort of long distance, which is roughly like 10 unit cells for this particular crystal. So long range correlations appear to be responsible for the halos. And this could also be demonstrated another way. Before I go on to explain that, um, I should say that um, the presence of halos had been proposed um, and actually by Peter Moore, um, he, he mentioned in another paper, the possibility of acoustic phonons contributing to diffuse scattering, but it had not been definitively shown for protein crystals because it's been very difficult to measure. Um, and another thing um, that was kind of uh, traditional in the biological diffuse scattering field was to mask out the, the Bragg diffraction, but in, in doing so, uh, they were also masking out these strong halo-like features. And that, um, that could corrupt the, the sort of weaker signals in between. And the important thing is that, you know, um, in scattering, you have to explain the dominant signal first, and then you have to explain the rest. Okay, um, so um, in our collaboration with David Case, um, we also took a different approach to try to understand uh, these halos. Um, and he had done multiple really giant, long, uh, full atom uh, MD simulations of the, the same crystal system. So here I'm showing diffuse scattering simulated from a one unit cell simulation. And what I mean there is that he took one unit cell and then put periodic boundaries. Um, and so turning it into a crystal and then doing a simulation. And then if you, if you do that simulation, allow it to sort of converge and calculate the diffuse scattering, you see that you see like a continuous pattern that's not very sharp anywhere. But if you increase the simulation size, so the box size um, to uh, turn it into a supercell, then you start seeing a change in the diffuse scattering pattern. And Dave went on to, to simulate a really large um, supercell of 343 unit cells, um, again, still with the periodic boundary conditions. And now you start seeing clearly the, the sort of halos emerging, right? There are no Bragg peaks in this calculation, yet it appears like there are because of those halos. So this was another um, piece of evidence that told us that, you know, if you allow your simulation to, to be sort of large enough such that different uh, unit cells could be talking to each other, then you will start seeing those signatures in the diffuse scattering. Um, unfortunately, um, the, even though uh, those simulations were really state of the art um, and probably the largest simulation that had been done of a, of a crystal, a protein crystal, uh, we were still far from the theoretically, the theoretical maximum agreement that we could get with the data. So here I'm showing the cross correlation, sorry, the correlation coefficient uh, as a function of resolution or inverse ref resolution. 
and our data quality was extremely good. And so we, the theoretical maximum was very high as well. Um, but the, uh, the best MD simulation still was maxed out around roughly around 0.7. And this was already you know, a huge improvement relative to what had been seen in the field. Um, but it was telling us that um, even with state-of-the-art MD, we couldn't really get uh, the agreement that we needed uh, in order to be uh, confident about the interpretation of the, the sort of um, trajectories that we would get from MD. So um, also at this point, we really wanted to understand like what is the underlying physics for uh, these halos, what is causing that? Um, and so Steve turned to a simpler, uh, more physical model that would tell us about that, um, that um, was also something that could be refined to the data. So Steve performed his own simulations of, this is um, a vibrational model of lattice dynamics based on um, the theory of crystal lattice dynamics. And um, essentially, what he did was he treated each protein in the unit cell as a rigid body and all the lattice contacts as springs. And um, so it's undergoing some kind of vibrational um, force. And he also created a supercell and then imposed periodic boundary, boundary conditions. Um, and then the very cool thing was that he actually um, refined the spring constants uh, to the diffuse scattering and not all of the diffuse scattering, he chose a very small subset of the halos. Um, and for the crystallographers in the audience, this a working data set of 1% is very small. But because these halos are three dimensional, uh, there's a lot of data per halo. Um, and so that's what he did. Uh, this is the gist of the model. And he refined that lattice dynamics model in multiple stages um, where each refinement cycle uh, essentially entails solving the equations of motion, then simulating the diffuse scattering, comparing it to the actual data, adjusting the spring constants, and then cycling that. Uh, and then he gradually removed strength, restraints on the springs until there was good convergence um, in terms of the fit and also um, in terms of the chi-square, but also visually um, agreeing with the measured shapes of the halos. So um, here's the result from that simulation, which is um, here, first of all, on the left is experimental diffuse scattering, just one slice of the, the Death Star. And all of the halos that are in blue boxes are the ones that were used in the fit. So you can see that they're very few. Um, but the refined lattice dynamics model does an excellent job of agreement uh, with the, the data. Uh, you could see that it looks very similar. This is probably the best agreement that the field had seen. Um, and if we zoom in here, uh, in this particular region, there are only three halos that were fit, and yet um, the simulation does a really excellent job. Um, and there are two things to notice here is that the sort of anisotropic shape of the halos also explained by the lattice dynamics simu simulation. But here, the proteins are completely rigid, yet we're seeing a cloudy pattern um, in the background. So this was telling us that these halos, the way they scatter, um, they scatter actually pretty far from the Bragg peaks uh, in order to create a cloudy looking pattern. And this was disturbing to us because um, the field had for a long time felt that this diffuse pattern, cloudy pattern was due to protein dynamics alone. But what we were finding is that lattice dynamics actually explain most of the variational diffuse scattering. Um, so that was actually a huge disappointment, yet one of the, the sort of, it was still a huge accomplishment in the sense that um, the lattice model did a much better job than the MD at explaining the diffuse scattering. Okay, um, but the fact that it explains the diffuse scattering very well, again, it reiterates the fact that um, lattice dynamics are, are responsible for a large part of the signal. So that was the end of episode two. And of course, you know, we set out to look for protein dynamics, but what we instead found was that the dominant signal was due to the lattice dynamics and we had to look further. Um, and so before I tell the last bit of my, the story, um, just a reminder, I'm showing this slide again, that one crystal yields two data sets. There's a Bragg diffraction and the diffuse scattering. 
Um, and any model of atomic motions have, has to agree between the two of them. Um, and so what Peter Moore had said in 2009 was that if you uh, refine your structure and you get B factors that are sort of implicit of a certain type of motion, that also has to give rise to diffuse scattering that matches experimental scattering. Um, and Steve actually did something clever, which was he actually took um, the model, the lattice dynamics model that was fit to the diffuse scattering and then asked the question, does it agree with the B factors from bag diffraction? So that's what he did here. Um, what I'm showing in blue is the B factors from the refinement of that lysozyme structure, uh, just from crystallographic refinement. And you can see that um, uh, this is B factors, this is a function of residue number in the protein chain. So it's, it's kind of like a spiky curve. Uh, if you calculate the, the B factors implied by the lattice dynamics model alone, you can see that a lot of the motion is actually um, explained by a lattice motions, but there's still a difference between the two. So in other words, um, there are atomic motions that are not explained uh, for by lattice motions, even though most of the intensities of the diffuse scattering is explained by the lattice motions. And so the question was, um, are the residuals due to protein motions? Um, and to answer this question, Steve did another simulation, this time of the internal dynamics of the protein. Um, and again, he used an el elastic network type of model, um, but this time sort of internal contacts within the protein of, within a certain distance of four angstrom uh, was treated as a spring. He also did some really clever parameterization um, so that there was only one uh, parameter per residue. And again, he did a supercell simulation with periodic boundary conditions. Um, and a key difference between this model and the lattice dynamics model is that this time he refined the spring constants to the B factors, not the diffuse scattering. And we were able to do that in part because we had such high resolution data that we had the full form of the B factors, the so-called atomic displacement parameters. So a lot of data per parameter. Um, and what I'm showing here is actually the result of the refinement. Um, blue, again, is just the lattice dynamics. Um, and black is the, the B factors from crystallographic refinement. And the purple um, crosses are the um, B factors from the model uh, after refinement. So we get pretty reasonable uh, agreement between the model and data. Now, to understand how well the model did, um, we had to sort of plot the data in a different way. Uh, so, because I already told you that most of the diffuse intensities are explained for by lattice dynamics, which are the sort of dominant signal. Um, we're now looking for something, a very small signal. And, and so it's advantageous to sort these, uh, the signal by uh, the length scale of the correlations. And you can do that by taking the Fourier transform. Um, and when you do that, you convert the intensities into what is known as a Patterson function. Um, in the, in the um, materials field, it's called a three, 3D delta PDF. Um, but essentially we're going from reciprocal space into real space. And if we zoom in near the origin, uh, the way to uh, sort of understand this plot is that any vector um, starting from the origin is telling us about the correlations um, along that direction in that length scale. So here we're looking at correlations below 10 angstroms, which is roughly the size of the protein. Um, and this is a topology map. So blue is very negative, dark red is very positive, and we're seeing uh, mountains and valleys. And you could see that there are correlations that extend very far from the origin, um, past the size of the molecule, and even past the size of the unit cell, which is what we would expect based on what we learned from lattice dynamics. The question is how well did each of the simulations do? So here I'm showing the experimental diffuse Patterson. And this is uh, the simulated diffuse Patterson from the lattice dynamics alone. And you could see that the shapes of these correlations are very similar, but uh, the amplitudes are very different uh, near the origin. So the lattice dynamics model, right? The proteins are treated as rigid bodies and they move they're correlated over many unit cells, um, 
And so we can get these correlations that are both short and long range, but not enough of a short range correlation. On the other hand, if we look at just the internal dynamics model, we only get short range correlations as we would expect um, because they should be the internal um, correlations of the protein. Um, what was great was that when we added the two, then we got remarkable agreement with experimental diffuse Patterson. So this is the best agreement that the field had seen in terms of explaining um, the contributions uh, to the diffuse scattering signal. And if we look at what sort of model is refined by the protein dynamics model, um, here um, on the left here, we can see that there's actually very uh, clear um, anti-correlated motions between the two domains of the lysozyme, uh, which um, had been predicted by other biophysical methods. And uh, this is more easily visualized in terms of the normal modes. So here we have the amplitudes really exaggerated, but showing that clear anti-correlated motion, um, explaining both the B factors as well as the diffuse scattering, which is really exciting. Um, but we wanted to actually wrap up this study with a, going back to the question that Peter Moore had posed, which is um, what if you uh, refine a model that's unrealistic? So we repeated this experiment but this time didn't allow, allow the domains to move relative to each other, but other parts of this, the molecule could. Um, and so what do we get from that? So here is the thing that's really scary is that you can fit the B factors just fine with either of these models. Um, and to similar uh, sort of goodness of fits. Um, and so again, the B factors cannot distinguish a, a sort of physical model from a non-physical model. However, the diffuse Pattersons do look different. And um, the, the one with the sort of hinge bending modes were uh, agreed with the data better. So uh, the take home is that again, B factors cannot distinguish the types of motion that the diffuse scattering can. So just to wrap up this, this story, um, uh, at the time of our, our publication last year, we finally were able to resolve some of the issues that, and kind of get to this um, question that Casper uh, and Clarage posed back in 1988, which is, can we get information about protein dynamics? Um, and yes, it's possible, but it's very difficult. Um, and because of that, crystallography has really only utilized Bragg diffraction um, so far, but there are these two data sets. Um, and what we showed is that if we are very careful about accounting for all of the scattering, um, then there's two sort of types of uh, um, correlated motions that um, the diffuse scattering will tell us about there. And I think they're both biochemically important. One has to do with lattice dynamics, but really they're telling us about correlated, um, long range correlations um, due to protein protein interactions. And then the other weaker signal, but still important signal is the protein dynamics. Um, and then in terms of future outcomes, uh, I told you about what's been done so far in terms of the Star Wars trilogy. What can we expect in the future? Um, and I'm gonna borrow some references from Lord of the Rings for the next trilogy. Uh, really, uh, we need to start with the fellowship of the scattering. So now that the community has been, been provided with data with high quality um, and we'll be publishing more soon, uh, I'm hoping that people will join and, and think about better ways to simulate um, models. And I think there will be implications also in terms of um, prediction of structure. Uh, since you know, in the past year, we've, saw, we've seen some really exciting things with AlphaFold. Uh, the question will be, can we not only predict structure, but also dynamics? And diffuse scattering will be a very good test bed for that. Um, there's still the question of two data sets, right? We have been treating them separately, but can we actually combine them and do a single refinement of both structure and dynamics? Um, and ultimately we still have to return to the biochemistry. Um, and so we need to explain how proteins work. Um, and I think we're off to a great start on that. Um, to begin with, um, I could tell you that in uh, next year, hopefully this will be an in-person meeting, the, the International School of Crystallography um, in 2022 will be on diffuse scattering. Andrew Goodwin and I are organizing 
and we have a great lineup of, of speakers. Uh, so I hope you will stay tuned to that. And with that, thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Nozomi, for this beautiful tour from the fundamentals of scattering to lattice dynamics and back to protein dynamics, really beautiful work. Mm -hmm. And you can also tell that from my isolation in Switzerland, already my American geography has been suffering. So. <laughs> okay, so questions. We already have a question in the chat. The first question is from Amanda Q. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, I mean, it, I wrote it in the chat, but basically I, so I don't know much about crystallographic data processing. So I don't know, like maybe this is obvious to the crystallographers, but um, how do you distinguish the halos from the Bragg peaks? Cause it seems to me like it could be just like a bigger diffraction spot, you know, like what in the processing workflow makes you say that's not the diffraction peak, that's something that's diffuse scattering. That's really, that's a really great question. And I don't think it's been very, much addressed um, so far, um, especially because we didn't expect halo scattering to be such a large contribution to the, the near Bragg scattering. Um, and so I think often actually it is being integrated as uh, the interfaction peak. Um, the, the strength of the halo scattering though is correlated to the Bragg peaks. Um, and fortunately in the crystallographic refinement, there are many ways to scale the data um, so that it becomes a physical model. And so we don't need to be super rigorous about separating the two. Um, however, you know, I do wonder, you know, like maybe we can get further with, in terms of um, model data agreement if we are careful about that. Um, there's also the possibility of using halos to actually uh, get intensities as, as kind of as a, what is the right, right word, as a proxy for um, Bragg diffraction in, in the event that the Bragg diffraction itself is hard to measure, especially at high resolution. Maybe we can use uh, the halo scattering as a proxy to, to get high resolution information. All right, next question. Remains to be done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Next question is from Hagen. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nozomi. This was really, really a beautiful uh, tour de force. Uh, Nozomi, I, I was wondering, because you mentioned that lattice dynamics, they of course depend on, uh, um, on lattice contacts between proteins. And the question that I have is, um, would, would these lattice dynamics be sort of specific, uh, even if only in a subtle sense to the, to the structure of the protein or its topology in general? Is there something you could you could check, or is there no information at all? Um, no, I think that's that's a really great question. So I do think that it must be correlated to the protein itself. Um, the fact that I think the, yeah, I mean I think the fact that um, we're seeing such complicated lattice dynamics has to come from the the thing that is actually in the crystal, the protein. And so it'd be really interesting to see if if some of these sort of lattice dynamics are happening um, in the direction where the protein is softest or um, where we're expecting motions to be coupled to the protein. Um, I mean, I could also imagine, question. yeah. Yeah, I could also imagine it, 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 it all also, of course, depends on how many proteins you have in the unit cell, what's the symmetry and so on and so forth. So I don't know how easy it will be to, to sort of disentangle these contributions. It will be difficult. Um, and so, yeah, that's why we started with the, the lowest symmetry form. But as we increase the unit cell dimensions and have more molecules, it'll become a greater challenge. But we have some interesting data. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, there are tricks, you know, to figure out the, to reconstruct the phase from boundary conditions and stuff. Is it applicable here? Um, I'm not totally sure I understand your question. <laughs> and I'm not sure well, even if you, I You talk about the square, <laughs> the square of the, of the, of the, uh, oh, yeah, the, the phase. So you, yeah. you lose the phase and there, there are mm -hmm. tricks to, to reconstruct it, to get it back uh, from the boundary that you, there is zero amplitude in, 
uh, at a certain distance. So uh, I'm just asking if, if you use it or if, if you consider it. Oh, uh, okay. Are you talking about the boundaries of the size of the crystal? No, it's in the diffraction, yeah. in the diffraction. Mm. Um, you know, I think that there, there is interest in, I don't think I can answer this question well. Um, but I think that is that, yeah, this, I think it's, I sort of understand what you're saying. And I think it's, it's, it's um, a mathematical uh, yeah. trick, you know, to, to, to get phase information from the pattern. Right. Okay, yeah. So. Can I think about this a little bit? And Yeah. Are you talking about, when you say the edge of the, the boundaries, are you talking about the edge of the diffraction pattern or? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, when you assume that at certain distance it becomes zero, for example, then you can figure out, you, you can really get some phase information. Mm. Yeah, but, maybe you can, maybe you can get in yeah. touch afterwards yeah. if you uh, want to go into more detail. Gilad had okay. a question. Yes, thank you, Nozomi. So um, can you compare the expected information content of the diffuse scattering to what people get, let's say, from uh, SAX and WAX methods? <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. Um, that's something that's interesting to us, especially since we do a lot of SAX and WAX. Um, there are other techniques that we could compare with as well, um, such as solid state NMR. Um, and in terms, so you're talking about the protein dynamics or also the yes. lattice dynamics. Yeah, so yeah, no, absolutely. We should compare with spectroscopies and those are things that are of great interest, I think, to not just our group, but other groups as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's definitely on the agenda. Is there like a general expectation for the, you know, the comparison between the two methods? Oh yeah, I definitely think that you know having proteins in a lattice will dampen a certain the, the, maybe like the, the amplitude of motions uh, just because of the lattice contacts. But um, what would be a really interesting question is what sort of motions are still allowed in the lattice, and then if we change it to a different crystal form, the same protein, do we see the same types of um, internal dynamics? Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the next question is from Catherine Royer. Hi, Nozomi. Hello. Hi, you're muted, Kathy. You're, you're muted still. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I would, uh, hi, great talk. I was gonna ask a question about how good the crystals have to be, but I have another question, maybe more interesting. And that is, do you think that if you applied pressure, you could differentially affect the internal motions and the, and the lattice motions um, and maybe sort of extrapolate <laughs> as a way of, of taking them apart? Yes, they're, they're both good, really great questions. Um, so to answer the first question, the crystals, how good do they have to be? We actually chose crystals that are extremely good by uh, sort of conventional crystallography, um, sort of, um, you know, like they result to a very high um, sort of um, resolution, right? And so, but because of that sort of reciprocal relationship between uh, sort of resolution limit, which is like dictated by how much atomic motions are in the crystal and the, and diffuse scattering, um, crystals that diffract, diffract to lower resolution will have more uh, diffuse scattering. And so one of the things that is very interesting to us to do next is to look at crystals like that where we're expecting maybe like an entire domain to be moving. Um, and, and, uh, and in those cases, oftentimes the, the diffuse scattering really overtakes the bright diffraction. Um, and, you know, to answer an earlier question, I do think there's some inf untapped information there where, you know, the bride diffraction has stopped, but the diffuse scattering has continued. Um, and it's still kind of a, a controversial subject in the field that we're hoping to address more. Um, 
your question about high pressure. Saul asked me the same question. I think it, <laughs> yes, <laughs> in theory, yeah. it'll be really hard um, because now we would have to account for um, scattering from probably diamond windows in this case, and in, in addition to other things. Uh, but it's doable. It's just you know we we have to look for a very small signal and be very confident in it. Um, but yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe we change the fluctuations, right? So. so I had a question regarding two effects that you mentioned. And I mean, I guess ideally what you would like to do is you would like to run a huge all atom MD simulation to compare to, but there are two limitations. One is size. And you mentioned that you expect or see correlations out to 10 unit cells or something, which means you'd need to have a huge system. But the second is time. And if you have real domain motions involved, you would also have to run for a very long time. So I was wondering whether you know which of these two contributions matters to which extent in the analysis. Um, you know, in terms of current limitations um, that we see even from a, a small protein, a large simulation of a small protein, um, the, the biggest reason is that we, even though uh, MD simulations will, are, they do a very good job of predicting the final structure, right? And, and, and by that, I mean like comparing to the crystal structure, the experimental st structure, and then you allow it to the MD to do its trajectory. And then you compare the final sort of um, equilibrated structure to the crystal structure. It doesn't deviate a lot, but it still deviates more than the precision of the actual um, the experimental precision of diffraction itself. And that's where a lot of the, um, the discrepancy is coming from um, because the halo scattering is so correlated to Bragg diffraction. If we can't simulate the Bragg diffraction at the precision of the experiment, we can't really explain the halo scattering either. So I think that would be a good place to start. And I think um, there is interest in the field to see if we can actually refine the MD simulations too. Diffuse scattering, that would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's another question by King Shukosh. Kings. Uh, hi. Hi, thanks. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, I'm just uh, curious, and maybe this question is a bit out there. Um, is there any temperature measurement of these? And the reason I'm asking, you know, I'm thinking in terms of um, regular phonon like when you have a Debye model dispersion relation, right? And there you can check with specific heat or something, but here we cannot do anything like that. But if there is some temperature measurement, then can we say something like an equivalent dispersion relation or anything like that? That's a really great question. Um, so yeah, I was expecting somebody to ask me about temperature sooner, uh, but changing the temperature is, is hard. So I'll just answer that part first. Um, and the reason why we did everything at room temperature was not only because we were, we were trying to understand about, you know, dynamics that are maybe ph physiological, but also because when you um, cool a crystal um, to cryogenic temperatures, which is what's typically done in, in, in crystallography, uh, you can strain the lattice and that itself will create some kind of disorder, which will then create its own diffuse scattering. And we wanted to minimize any sort of strain on the lattice in order to understand um, the origins of, of the diffuse scattering. Um, but we have actually done measurements at different temperatures and things are ongoing on that front. On your other question, um, actually, so from the lattice dynamics model, we can calculate the, the dispersion relations and yeah. compare um, from that, get the sound velocities that we would expect through the crystal. Right. And that was um, within the right order of magnitude. There aren't that many measurements of sound velocities in protein crystals, but that was in the right ballpark. So that was also um, a good sign. Huh, that's excellent. Awesome. Thank yeah. you again for a great talk. Mm -hmm. And with the, the last question currently in the chat is from Ivan Kolutsa. Hello, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I have a question related to the type of protein-protein interaction that you can probe with, the, with, with this method. I was wondering if, for instance, you could observe any interactions that are correlated or mediated by the water itself that is, uh, uh, in your case, it looks like a background noise, but maybe highly correlated water molecule that sometimes do spend more time close to the structure. Uh, 
uh, could have a different kind of uh, a role in, in this halo. Like for instance, uh, we did speculate in a recent publication that they could even induce uh, interactions before a protein aggregation takes place inducing unfolding in some cases in the protein. So I was wondering if you could even reach that kind of precision, let's say. Hmm. That was a really great question. And I think that would be a question that we could go after with MD once the force fields have, or well, once we get to a place where maybe we can actually agree with the experimental diffuse scattering better then we can sort of think about that. Um, with the lattice dynamics model, we didn't really think about solvent in sort of any explicit way. So there might be creative ways to think about the contribution of that, but I, I think what you're asking for requires more detail. Um, and so maybe MD is the way to go, I, I'm not sure. But in oh. terms of protein-protein interactions, what I was thinking was more, you know, that um, there are systems that where there is long range communication that's important in, in um, let's say like a filamentous structure or something like that, where um, it's important for electron transfer from redox center to redox center and to, to think about um, how correlated those <laughs> different atoms are in, in, in different monomers, it would be really interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be very nice to try to think about the use also some coarse grain model that have more resolution than, for instance, the, the lattice model that you have, like something intermediate between the uh, the, the full atomistic, full detail, and uh, let's say the simpler model, because in the process of coarse graining, there is also something to learn by looking at mm -hmm. what you start to miss or so, something that appears in the future. So it would be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, in the meantime, we got another question by Bill Eaton. Bill, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, no, Zumi, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. At the very beginning of your lecture, uh, you pointed out that uh, protein crystals are not like ordinary crystals because over half of the crystal is water. And I've always regarded uh, a protein crystal not as a crystal really, but as an oriented solution. <laughs> uh, but it, def it does diffract like a crystal. So because it's so much like an oriented solution, as has been proven over and over again by comparisons of crystal structures with NMR structures. Uh, I'm wondering why you, uh, or can you tell me whether you can get uh, some help from the detailed atomistic dynamical information that's contained in uh, NMR relaxation measurements? I don't know whether they've been done in detail for lysozyme, for example, but it, is it worth looking into? Can that be of more help than uh, theoretical calculations to use actual experimental data on motions? That's a really great question. Um, and yeah, so I think that that definitely is a direction that would be interesting to us. Um, and I should mention that the, um, the hinge bending motion modes that we, we saw in our protein dynamics model we compared with a solution data as well. I think though that the degree of motion that we'll see in a lattice will still be smaller. Um, and so it could be challenging to, um, to sort of do like a, an apples to apples sort of comparison, but it could be a way to maybe have more realistic um, simulations. If we use data from say NMR um, at the moment, you know, we because it's so complicated <laughs> interpreting the diffuse scattering signal, we've been focusing more on other experimental techniques that probe the proteins directly in the crystal, such as solid state and NMR, um, for example. Um, but it, yeah, no, I, I think what you're saying is, is um, a, suggesting is a good one. And, you know, other things yeah. that have been mentioned, like the yeah. wide angle X-ray scattering is also um, a good, good way forward. Yeah, I can see that there's certainly the domain uh, motions uh, could be damped uh, by the mm -hmm. intermolecular uh, contacts in the crystal, but uh, the sort of more subtle internal uh, uh, motions of dihedral angle motions and even dihedral angle flips, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
could be readily seen uh, by NMR. So I, I had a second question because the first time I ever heard crystallographers talk about diffuse scattering was about 40 years ago when I met this very smart applied mathematician from Cambridge, Gerard Bracon. And he, I think his, his idea was that he could actually get phase information from looking at the diffuse scattering. Has anything ever come of that? Um, <laughs> I think that is an idea that has been explored a little bit, um, but it, I think it's a little controversial. So we're still like really at the point where we're still just trying to understand the amplitude of, of the diffuse scattering. Um, but this is why I couldn't really answer the earlier question. I, I think it's something that we're still thinking of as a field. Um, but yeah, so I can't really answer that question, I suppose, but I will think about it more. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Gilad had another question. Yeah, since it looks like I'm the last uh, question, so my question is, uh, what's with the flannel shirts? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer. <laughs> it was, was a requirement for this photo, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's what um, I figured, yeah. We were in the middle of uh, many, many synchrotron runs, and uh, I took my lab on a break to a farm in Ithaca, one of my favorite places. Uh, in Ithaca, and I just felt like it was appropriate for the farm. <laughs> Looks cool. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great question. Good. That's a <laughs> great end for our seminar today. Thank you very much again, Nozomi, for a wonderful presentation and your beautiful results. And I hope thank that you. many of you will join us again uh, on the 22nd for your Genderlein's talk about correlation spectroscopy. Thanks for joining. Have a good day, uh, evening.